So we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. It's good to be with you guys. If you're new or visiting, my name's Tyler. I'm one of the pastors here, and I lead our downtown congregation. If you have a Bible, go and open up to the book of Matthew. To the book of Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry about it, but always, it's always a good idea to bring one to see for yourself in the text where we are. So we're continuing our way through Jesus' teaching on prayer. Historically, the church has called this section of teaching the Lord's Prayer, not because it's the only way Jesus prayed, but because it's the template he gave to us for how we are to pray. So let's go and read it together. Matthew 6, 9 through 13, this is Jesus' teaching on prayer. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now this is our fifth week in this series and today we're focusing on the phrase, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Now there's so much to get through, but before we do that, before we get into it, it's important to remember what is the purpose of Jesus' teaching? Because the purpose is not merely for us to study and learn and contemplate a theology of prayer, the purpose that we would become a prayerful people. I mean, even as I was prepping this sermon, I found myself immediately going to the content of what the kingdom of God is and divorcing it completely from prayer. I mean, we've spent four Sundays in this text, and I began to ask myself, has my prayer life begun to change because of what Jesus has said? A am I praying more often? Am I praying differently because of the content of what he taught? And maybe you've been here every week, maybe you've been here one week for these sermons, but here's a question to ask yourself from the beginning of this. Have your prayers been different? Have they been different? Have you had more confidence and boldness because you're approaching your Father in heaven? Have you stopped heaping up empty phrases because you know you're gonna be heard? Have you found yourself saying, Father, would you hallow your name? Not, not just say it as a rote religious reciting of words, but as a genuine desire, God, hallowed be your name. Have you believed him and trusted him so much that you actually want his will to override your own? Have you been listening and changing because of it. Now what's incredible is actually, we've already begun to hear stories of how God's changing us through this, that slowly but surely, he's teaching us to pray. Now I want you to know this, your prayer life is not gonna revolutionize in one day or one sermon or one week, but if you'll stay faithful, I promise it will. If you'll stay faithful and keep praying and keep hearing his word through prayer and you keep continuing um, in faithfulness to it, if you do that, you'll experience the peace and power of God promises through it. Because as good and as great as it is to learn what God has to say in his word, church, it's even better to obey him. It's great to learn, it's even better to obey. So if the Lord's prayer changes our theology of prayer, but it doesn't change the way we pray, then we have not heard his word in the way he wants us to. If you just have new theology and sound bites to remember, but you don't pray more, we haven't heard the way we're meant to. That's my hope, that's our hope for this series, that it makes our church so different, that our city would be so different, that the nations would be so different because of the way that we pray. That's what Jesus' purpose and intent is in this text. So look back at it, verse nine and 10, this is where we're gonna be. Pray then, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Here's the text. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now keep verse nine up there. This template for prayer, it builds on itself. It's meant to flow from one truth to another. God, Jesus is being intentional in the way he's designing this for us. So you begin, when you're praying, you begin. What does that say, verse nine? Our Father in heaven. So you begin as you're praying, going, okay, you're creator God outside of time and space and my constraints and my reality, and yet you're my Father. You're my protector. You're the one who sees me. You're the one who loves me. You're the one who looks out for me. And since you're my Father and I don't deserve that kind of love, hallowed be your name. You should be adored. You should be loved. You should be praised. There's no one who even compares with you. 
Nobody's even close. So why would anyone else get praise? Why would anyone else be the center of my life and of this world? God, your name be hallowed. Then what does it look like? Look how it goes. Hallowed be your name, verse 10. What does it look like for your na- his name to be hallowed and revered? His kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, that his will and his wants would overrule all others, and that we would joyfully follow him the way it is in heaven. And when his will is followed, then you're in his kingdom. There's that phrase, kingdom come. The kingdom of God coming to earth, listen, should be a major component and aspect to your praying. That's what Jesus is saying. One of the major things you should be praying for is that God's kingdom would come. Now this reality, this concept of the kingdom of God is so massive and so important in the Bible, it's almost daunting to attempt to teach on the topic because there's so much that should and could be said. But if we're gonna pray your kingdom come, we need some framework to understand what we're asking God to do. So let me give you a simple definition of what it means, what the kingdom of God means. This is not novel to me, unique to me. I'm sure I stole this from somebody, but I can't remember, okay? Here's what it says. The kingdom of God, here's the definition, is the loving rule and reign of God over every area of life. The kingdom of God is the loving rule and reign of God over every area of life. So while your will be done, it captures God's specific wants, his specific desires. His kingdom is the larger ecosystem, the society he creates as his people obey him. His kingdom is where his rule is made manifest. And this kingdom, this reign, this rule, it's not an oppressive one. It's not a crushing one, but it's a reign of love over us where all things flourish under God. See, it's in his kingdom where human beings and creation for that matter, find their true freedom and fulfillment. We find freedom and fulfillment in submission to him, in following him. This was God's purpose in creation. The kingdom of God, Jesus came preaching it, but it began back in creation. God's intent in creating you and creating me was to share himself in love with us so that we would reflect his kingdom to the world. The Bible begins and the Bible ends with the kingdom of God. Look at Genesis 1, 26 through 28. I wanna show you what it means to be in his image and to reflect his kingdom. Verse 26 of Genesis 1. You've heard these verses before, but I want you to notice the kingdom language within them. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So man in our image after our likeness, then what is the next sentence? And let them have dominion. Kingdom language. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Do you see the connection? To be in his image, to be in his likeness is then to reflect that kingdom and that dominion over creation. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He made us male and female for what purpose? And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it. Do you see the connection? To be in his image means you are put here to reflect to the world as God rules over me in the exact same way I rule over creation. If he rules over me in love and it gives life, then I rule over creation in the exact same way. And what you see in Genesis is there's no spiritual, physical disconnect. They're one. God is with Adam and Eve in the garden. They're one. There's no disconnect there. And so everything is wed together perfectly. Creation began with the kingdom of God, and despite our rebellion against him, our sin against him, our distrust of him, God will one day restore his kingdom finally and fully. Look at Revelation 22. So it's the first two chapters, last two chapters. Revelation 22, listen to this picture of what's coming. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne, the throne of God and of the Lamb, the king's back. The throne of God and the Lamb, the Lamb being a metaphor for Jesus. Through the middle of the street of the city, you notice how, how physical it is. It's a city. And also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. These leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. 
when God's kingdom comes back finally and fully, what happens? The nations are healed. It says the next verse, no longer will there be anything accursed. Spiritual, physical, there won't be anything cursed. Why? But the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. That's why. And his servants will worship him. And they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord their God will be their light. This last phrase. And they will reign forever. Kingdom. What God is working all things to through his son is to make his image bearers back to our rightful spot where we do what? We are reigned over by God. All things are blessed because of it, healed because of it, and then we now reign with him and we reflect to the world what his kingdom is like. That's the mission of our lives, to be under his love and reflect that to the world around us. Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation 21 through 22 are the only times in the Bible where the kingdom of God is fully and perfectly expressed here. And what do you see in both scenes? What do you see in both scenes? The scope of his reign is massive. It's it's over all things. It's not over just like one day of the week or just over your emotions or a couple of people or your family traditions or the values you care most about. His reign is over all things. The kingdom of God does not come and try to fit into your little life. God calls your life into his massive kingdom. He calls you into his massive kingdom to be a part of what he's doing. And in his kingdom, there's nothing off limits. What you see is there's no boundaries between religious and normal life, no sacred, secular divide. In his kingdom, all things conform to his will. That means worship services and work ethic. That means art and science. That means friendships and hobbies. That means social structures and individual personality. So when Jesus comes on the scene and he's preaching the kingdom of God is here, he has all of life in mind. He has all of life in mind. Jesus does not just want your Sundays, he wants your life. He wants your life. He doesn't just want to change your spirituality, he wants to change who you eat dinner with. He doesn't just want to make you a little bit nicer. He wants to shatter your categories. Jesus is preaching the kingdom of God. He's casting out demons. He's preaching, he's healing people, and he's calling out the spiritual abuse of power. And he's calling out those who try to abuse those he loves. His declaration is not, hey, I'm here, and there's a way for your life not to be messed with, to be really comfortable, and plus, you get into heaven too. It's not his message. His message is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven has broken into the world in the kingdom of darkness. And instead of the king come to crush unruly subjects, he is the king come to save us. Instead of the king come to put down the rebellion, he's the king who's come to die for rebels. That's the good news of the gospel, that God's come to those who have rejected him and he's given us hope and salvation in Jesus. He's given us a way through him back to God and back into his kingdom. But there is one condition. There is one condition. When the kingdom of God shows up, you are repeatedly confronted with this one condition you have to respond with, and it's repentance. It's repentance. See, in this life, sin still affects our hearts, it affects our relationships, it affects our social structures, It affects everything. And so submission to the eternal life and love of God and his kingdom, you have to understand, it will require repentance in us. Jesus said this explicitly, Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. His whole preaching ministry was defined by this statement. When you read that in the text, don't think that's a one-time thing that he preached. Look at what it says. From that time, from that time, Jesus began to preach. It's the thesis statement of his preaching ministry. You ever notice how preachers like us tend to have like the same sermon basically over and over again, right? You ever notice that? We got it from Jesus, okay? He started it. 
Because what he's saying is the common experience and response when the kingdom of heaven is invading your life is one of repentance. And what does that word mean? All repentance means is you recognize and you admit to God and to others that he's right and you're wrong. That's what it is. It's to say everything you say is right and if I'm in contradiction to you, I'm wrong. That I need forgiveness, that I need mercy, that I need help and then striving to live in line with his word. That's repentance, so listen, listen. When we pray, God, your kingdom come, you better get ready to repent if you want any part of it. Because Jesus says when the kingdom of heaven shows up, repentance will be our response. And I think, I think as a church, because of the way we preach, because of the way we study the Bible, because of who we are as a people, I think we get that at some, in some ways on a personal level. I think we get it on a personal level, but I think we don't get it as much on a relational and societal level. So we focus our attention on God's kingdom coming to change our personal disciplines like Bible reading or church attendance or emotional and psychological health or our family rhythms. Now all those things are right and good and God's kingdom does speak to those things. But in our church, in our tradition of faith, we tend to ignore the social aspects of God's kingdom coming and the repentance that that would require of us. So we'll pray things like, God, your kingdom come over my sexuality or your kingdom come over my sense of God's love, but do we pray, God, your kingdom come so that immigrants and refugees would be protected and loved? We pray, God, your kingdom come in my marriage. Your kingdom come in my dating relationships, but do we pray, God, your kingdom come in the way that I love and the justice across ethnic groups in our church and our city? We pray, God, your kingdom come for my children or this family illness, but do we pray it for our government and the policies that affect millions of people in poverty? Do we pray it for the unborn child and the terrified mother who has no idea what to do? God's kingdom coming in those areas is gonna cause us to repent in ways we are much less comfortable with. That's what it'll do. The more I've prayed, so just personally, the more that I have prayed, God, your kingdom come, and the more that I've sought to be a part of it, do you know what's happened in me? The more I've had to repent. And listen, not because my intentions in seeking and praying for the kingdom of God were evil. No, listen, really important you understand this. But because the more prominent the kingdom of God, the more clearly you'll see hidden sins and weaknesses you didn't know were there. The more prominent the kingdom of God, the more clearly you're gonna see hidden sins and weaknesses you didn't know were there. As you seek to love people and serve people in all the ways God calls us to, you will inevitably be confronted with the fact that your sin runs much deeper than you realize. Now listen, in a kingdom of grace, repentance is not a curse, it's a gift. Know that. In a kingdom of grace like the kingdom of God, repentance is not a curse or a banishment, it's a gift. See, this has happened to me repeatedly as I've sought to do this just in our church, as I've sought to be one little part of God making this church look more and more like his kingdom. Over the last couple of years, there's a, there's a myriad of ways this is happening in our church and city and the nations, and we'll get into that in a second. But to localize it in our church, the last couple of years, myself, other leaders in this church, a lot of people in this church, we've wanted to ensure that women and people of color and those who experience same-sex attraction genuinely feel wanted and safe with us genuinely belong to this people and actually powerfully shape how we go forward together. We've wanted that not to be trendy, but to be faithful. To be faithful to the gods whose kingdom looks a lot more like that than oftentimes what people who look just like me may want in order to be faithful. And we have a ways to go, but can I tell you, God has been faithful to begin to work in some small but significant ways. 
And as I have personally sought to love and listen and serve these women, these men, I've had to learn the hard way, the really hard way, that my ignorance is greater than I realized, that I have bias I didn't know was there, that I have weakness that I didn't know was there. As I've sought to love people, I've just, I've failed. I've miscommunicated. I've needed instruction, I've needed correction. I know I've been the recipient of grace and patience way more often than I know. And there were times, there were times where I was like sincerely trying to be helpful. I was sincerely trying to be loving. I thought what I was doing was helpful and loving and I've had very brave, courageous, mature brothers and sisters have to pull me aside and go, I know you wanted to be helpful, but it wasn't. I, I know you were trying to, but it actually just hurt me more. And do you know what happens in those moments when you're actually trying to advance the kingdom of God? Do you know what my defense mechanism is? Do you know what my flesh does? Is I revert to my kingdom's definition of love. And my kingdom's definition of love is this. Well, if I was really trying to be helpful and loving, that's all that matters. My kingdom says, if I tried, what more could you ask of me? But then God's kingdom by the Spirit comes to my conscience and says, that's not love, and you know it. His word goes, love is patient, and love is kind. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love is long-suffering. Love lays down its life for brothers and sisters. Because as you seek to actually advance the kingdom of God, it is so easy to be disappointed and frustrated with yourself, so easy to want to give up, so easy to be cynical rather than steadfast and hopeful. And you want to give up because the kingdom of God is challenging. It challenges us at every level. But what did Jesus tell us was going to happen? Matthew 4, 17. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When the kingdom of heaven shows up with all of its blessings and all of its glory and all of its love, repentance comes along with it. The kingdom of heaven is constantly confronting our own idolatry. When you try to advance it, you realize I'm worshiping so many little gods all over the place that I didn't even realize. The kingdom of heaven shows you, shows me, oh, you want change with no pain. Oh, you want reconciliation with no justice. Oh, you want salvation without repentance. That's why we have to beg God to do it. <laughs> We're not, God's kingdom's too massive. It's too lofty to be accomplished by our feeble strength. God's the only one strong enough, the only one wise enough, the only one loving enough to bring it into existence. That's why Jesus is saying, pray like this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Start with praying. Now hear me, praying for God to bring his kingdom doesn't diminish our actions, it empowers our actions. It doesn't diminish our responsibility, it empowers us to fulfill that responsibility. Every significant work that I have seen at this church of God's kingdom advancing and church history would attest to this, all of them are fueled by prayer that nobody sees. They're all fueled by prayer nobody sees. Now listen, are you thinking, well, surely have people prayed and done nothing? And maybe you're fearful, you're saying, well, if we just pray the kingdom of God, we'll never actually do anything. And have people prayed and not done anything? Yes and no. Yes and no. So people have prayed, your kingdom come, thoughtlessly, carelessly, but most of the time the people who pray and do nothing don't pray that often and don't pray with much conviction. What I've seen is the people who keep praying and hone their prayer request to specific kingdom ask and keep praying and keep praying, they're the people who eventually move into action and stay there. Because without prayer, you may begin kingdom work, but you won't stay in kingdom work. Without prayer, you may have enough energy and excitement and zeal to start, but without prayer, you won't stay. See, ushering in God's kingdom is not first and foremost a call to go out there and do. It's first and foremost a call to go inside your closet and pray. 
That's what Jesus is telling us. First and foremost, go inside your closet and pray. Look at the history of our church. The planting of this church 16 years ago was Matt and a small team of people praying. Our For the City Network to serve and bless the city started with praying. Our desire to be a church that has good theology and great mission starts with praying. Our For the Nations team who wants to see unreached people groups reach with the gospel, it starts and continues with prayer. I mean, it's crazy to think, I've been leading in this church now for 10 years. And in 10 years' time, you kind of get a kind of a vantage point of movements of God and the Spirit and what he's doing in the midst of our people. And one of the things that I begin to notice is you can see a connection. It's not like an immediate one-to-one, but there's this correlation between the vibrancy of our church and ministries associated with it and the prayer associated with it. You can really see it. That when prayer has waned in certain areas in our church, so has power, so has resolve. So has sacrifice, so has sustained action. See, while prayer reveals what you truly value, prayer also moves your heart to what you should value. It reveals what you value, but also it moves your heart to what you should value. So if all you pray for is you and people who look like you and live around you and have your name, one, that reveals what you truly value, and two, it reinforces that's all that you should value. But what I found in my life is the more that I pray for other people, the more that I pray for the city, the more that I pray for the nations, do you know what I find happening? My heart and my life slowly moving towards action in those areas. Prayer is revealing, but also it's transformative in nature and moves us to what we should value. So here's my question to you. Where is God stirring in you desires to take part in ushering in his kingdom? Where? Like all of us should feel his kingdom come in my personal life, my personal holiness, my relationship with God, but his kingdom is so much bigger than our individual lives. Where outside of your own little world is God pointing you to and saying, there, that neighborhood, that group of people, that cause, that's where you need to be. You have a passion for it, that's where you need to be. Where is it? Wherever it is, start praying. Start praying specifically. Start asking God to move, and you need to know as you enter into God's kingdom work, you better get ready to repent. Because you're gonna see things you didn't know were there. But then you'll see God change people and lift up people, and there's more joy in giving than in receiving. That's what Jesus said. But I find it fascinating, as great and as good and as noble as God's kingdom is, why do our prayers always revert back to us? Right, why? Like if you're a Christian, you know you should pray for God's kingdom to come. You can read the Bible and know what that looks like and what that means, but why, at the end of the day, do we, are we more fervent, more zealous, more authentic for prayers that revolve around us? And our kingdoms and our interests, there's a lot of reasons why. But at the end of the day, it's because deep down we're scared. We're scared. Under our pride, under our doubts, is a fear. If God's kingdom comes, then what about us? What about me? We don't pray for his kingdom to come because deep down our fear is that his kingdom's gonna come and I'm gonna be forgotten. That others are gonna receive a blessing and life and all the things God promised and I'm not gonna receive the love that I'm after, the healing I'm after, the relationships I'm after, the career I'm after, the future I'm after. And so we gravitate first and foremost to praying for ourselves so often out of fear because if his kingdom comes, what about me? What about me? I see this play out in my son, Henry, all the time. Henry is our middle child and he has all the struggles that a middle child faces. And as a middle child, his birthday is two days after his older sister's birthday, right? So he's just, he, I love him so much, he constantly feels, oh, he constantly feels overlooked, 
even when he hasn't been overlooked. And it, sometimes it's so difficult when he's sad to get his little heart to believe that me and Lauren genuinely are thoughtful about him and we love him and we're for him. But anytime, what happens, anytime he sees his sisters get something unique to them, he interprets it as, then you must not care about me. Then you must not care about me. We just, we just got um, L, his older sister, tickets to, for her, her and Lauren to see uh, Matilda play together. And Lauren was like, do you wanna go? I was like, do you wanna go? Um, I will gladly sacrifice for the team on this one. Um, and so Lauren and her are gonna go together. So we gave Elle, like, here's your present, here's your gift. And Henry immediately begins to cry. Buddy, what's wrong? He's like, but I wanna go with mommy. I was like, you wanna go to Matilda? Like, for real? There's no fighting in that, buddy. That's not gonna happen. He's like, Iron Man's in that, right? I'm like, no, he's not. He doesn't even want it. If I said, he wanna go to Matilda, he was like, can I have something different? Like, that's what he would think. But his sister got it. And because he struggles with feeling overlooked, the interpretation is, so y'all don't think about me. So you don't care about me and my desires and my wants. He's scared he'll be forgotten, so blessing to other people hurts him. You and I have the exact same fear. What if God's kingdom in our church means recognition for someone else? What if God's kingdom in our city means more attention attention paid to a different neighborhood and a different school that you don't go to, where you don't live? What if the kingdom of God and the nations means your money serving the purposes of unreached peoples and not your own personal dreams and desires? What if the kingdom of God costs? Because listen, for the kingdom of God to advance in this world will always mean some form of sacrifice for the church, always. And I love that Jesus knows us so well. Jesus knows that we're scared about this. Our king, he knows we're scared about this. He knows how quickly you and I forget what it's like having God as your father in heaven. How quickly you and I buy this lie that if I don't take care of me, then nobody will. This is why the Lord's Prayer, it begins Not with your kingdom come, it begins with our Father in heaven. Because before you ever pray, God Almighty, bring your kingdom, I need to remember, you're my dad. You're my father. You see me, you love me, you're for me. So whatever happens, I can know that for sure. And Jesus makes a promise to you and to me. He's gonna bring the kingdom of God and you will not be forgotten. You won't. He's gonna find a way to bring in the kingdom of God through your sacrifice and you will not be forgotten by him. The lies, the whispers will say, you can't trust him, but he makes a promise. Luke 12, 30, for all the nations of the world seek after these things and your father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom. And these things will be added to you, this last line. Fear not, little flock. Fear not, little flock for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The kingdom coming is your Father's. Yes, he's your King, yes, he's your Lord, but he is your Father, and he gave his Son to death so that you would always have a place and always have a standing that can never be taken away. You're standing in the kingdom of God, your sin can't even take it away. Death can't even take it away. The greatest foe this world has, death has already been conquered in the resurrection. So don't fear when the kingdom of God means repentance for you. Don't fear, little flock. I t- my, this week I'm telling myself, Tyler, don't fear when it means giving away so that others can thrive. Don't fear when it means restraint of your own desires. Don't fear, because what did Jesus say? It's your Father's good pleasure. It's his joy. It's his happiness to give you the kingdom of God. He won't let you go. Don't let your failures keep you from being a part of it. 
Some of you really don't have kingdom of God sort of prayers and dreams because you don't feel like you're worth it. You don't feel worthy of it. You don't feel like because you've done things, things have been done to you that God could never use you. That is a lie. Jesus didn't die to make you somewhat clean. He died to make you brand new. And some of you want to give up. Some of you in this church used to dream dreams that were massive that only prayer could fulfill because they're so big and so expansive. You used to give your life away, but you started trying to live this out and you got hurt. And you got cynical and you got jaded and you kind of gave up. So your father knows what you need. You don't have to bring the whole kingdom of God. Not one of us can. That's why it's this church and every other church in the world that's a part of doing this. But he's bringing the kingdom of God. He wants you in it. Don't let sin and suffering keep you from it. And the way you start is by joining him first and foremost in prayer. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So here's how we're going to end this service. We're going to end by, by doing this. We're going to end by praying together that God's kingdom would come in three areas, our church, our city, and the nations. So in just a second, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get a little crazy and actually pray in church, okay? Um, we're gonna break up in a second. Don't do it yet. And don't start leaving right now. So stay in the room, okay? Um, I will just call you out when you walk, okay? Stay in the room. In grace, in love, but stay. Um, <laughs> we're, we're gonna break into groups of three, okay? No more than three, rule followers, hold people accountable to this. No more than three, why? I want everyone to pray. It's a, a group of 10, not all of you are gonna pray, okay? We're gonna get into groups of three and we're gonna start praying that God's kingdom will come. And I'm gonna give you a slide of specific things we can pray for God's kingdom to come because we wanna be a church that loves God, loves this church, loves our city, and loves the nations. Now this list I'm gonna give you is not exhaustive. It's a couple of ideas to spur you to pray, but if the Spirit of God prompts you to pray something different, then pray that. And what's gonna happen, you're getting groups of three, you're gonna go around individually and pray, and if you get through all three of you before I come up and pray, just keep praying, okay? Just keep praying together, or just sit there silently, but just keep praying. This is a starting point. Now, if you're here and you're like, I haven't prayed in a long time, or you're here and you're like, this makes me feel uncomfortable. Or you're here and you're like, I'm an introvert and I already want to find an exit. Or if, if, if you're here, honestly, and you're not even a believer, like your friend invited you, you're like, I came to pick the worst day to come to church. I should just come to Easter. They ain't praying on Easter. I should have come then, right? If you're here and you're, listen, in any of those categories, can I just tell you something? I really believe you're here because God wants your heart. I know you, don't, you came here because someone maybe asked you or invited you or you didn't even know why you came. I know why you came, because God actually wants to speak to you. So all I'm asking you to do is try. Just try. Because even the, the prayer that's full of faith, that's two words, is more powerful than a prayer that's eloquent with no faith. So that's what we're gonna do. Go ahead right now, break into groups of three, turn your chairs to each other. Break groups of three, introduce yourself real quick, and we're gonna pray together. Screen. All right. Behind me is the screen of prayer, is what we're gonna pray through. I'm gonna give you guys a couple of minutes. Go in the circle, pray like you believe God's kingdom's gonna come. Pray for these things now. Go ahead, pray.
our Father in heaven, our protector, our, the one who loves us, the one who sees us, God, we're praying to you that your name would be hallowed, your name would be revered, that your will would be done, and that your kingdom would come in this church. God, make us a people who strive to be holy like you. Make us a church that don't just share space with one another across ethnic groups, we share love and relationship. God, show up in this city. God, your kingdom come in such a way that our friends who don't see Jesus the way we do, help them see him. God, we're not better than them, we need grace just like them. We want them to see Jesus, you're as satisfying as you say. God, in this city, your kingdom come and bring justice for the marginalized and oppressed for the widow and for the orphan, for the immigrant and the refugee, for those who don't have power, those who are suffering under the weight of others' racism or homophobia or misogyny and all the ways, God, that there's injustice in this city. God, would you work in such a way that you would show what your kingdom is like and you'd save in the process. God, bring your kingdom among the nations. Oh God, would you do this great work we want you to do to have a hundred church planting movements amongst a hundred unreached peoples. God, you deserve glory everywhere, everywhere, because you're that good, you're that satisfying, you're that holy, you're that true. So God, help the nation see, God, for our goers right now who are asleep or waking up or wherever they are, God, help them know your love for them, this love this church has for them, that God, the mission they're on, God, you will finish it, you will bring it to completion, God, in all these ways and the million other ways, God, we need your kingdom to come, God, do it. Not my kingdom, not our kingdom, God, yours. Knowing it's your good pleasure to meet every need and every desire of our hearts in it. God, wake this church up from settling for smaller kingdoms that won't last. Wake us up to see where joy in life is found. It's always found in you. So we follow after you. We give our lives to you. We sing to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen, church. Let's stand. Let's sing together.